Hi, everybody. Let's get started. Thank you so much for att attending. Uh, so slide two, please. So welcome to our third regional plan review virtual Q&A. My name is Kathleen Frelick and I will be moderating today's session on climate change. We'll be giving a quick presentation before we jump into questions, but I'd just like to inform our attendees that tonight's session is being recorded and we'll be posting, the project, posting it on the project website at www.shapeyourcityhalifax.ca slash regional dash plan. Uh, next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to give everyone some quick instructions for using Microsoft Teams. First of all, if you would like to use closed captioning for today's session, please click the CC button below in the, in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Next slide, please. You may leave the session at any time by clicking the leave button on the upper right corner of the screen, and the link to the session will remain active throughout the event so you can return if you would like. Next slide, please. The main goal of this event is to answer your questions and gather feedback. You can submit comments and questions throughout the session using the chat screen on the right to the right of the presentation and by clicking ask a question. Next slide, please. The minutes from this presentation will form the public record. You're welcome to include your name with your question uh, if you would like, but you may also post anonymously by clicking post as anonymous. Next slide, please. And finally, you can type your question into the box that says ask a question and hit enter, and we will uh, be going through those questions uh, following our presentation. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we will be giving a short presentation on how climate action is being considered through the ongoing regional plan review. And then our team of HRM staff who have contributed to this section of the, uh, of the project will be available to answer your questions. In addition to this session, we invite everyone to visit the project website to participate in our other engagement tools, including our survey, uh, or to submit comments or questions. We'll be gathering public feedback until July 16th. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to turn things over to Leah Perrin, who is the principal planner for regional planning uh, for a short presentation on climate. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, so yeah, my name is Leah Perrin. I'm a principal planner with Regional Planning, and today I'll be presenting on climate. Uh, slide 10, please. We're here today because we are reviewing the regional plan, which means we're evaluating our land use policies and making sure they represent the direction that council would like to set. We're contemplating how the municipality is physically organized and growing. We kicked off this phase of public engagement on May 20th at Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee, which is the primary advisory body for this work. Today's session is focused on our climate policy. Slide 11. The regional plan is a strategic document. It was the first plan adopted of after amalgamation that provided a region-wide vision for land use. First adopted in 2006, it provided a comprehensive outline of how growth and development should take place until 2031. Slide 12. <clears throat> the regional plan is powerful in guiding the municipality's planning and decision making. As a high level policy document, it does a few different things. First, the plan provides policy direction for planning at the regional and community level. The regional plan sits above our community or secondary plan level documents and above our land use bylaws, and it sets that region wide policy intent. So where something is important enough that it should apply everywhere, regional plan policy can set up land use bylaw regulations that would be applied region wide. So for example, for coastal elevation setbacks, those policies sit in the regional plan and then they're rolled out in every community's land use bylaw. Uh, the regional plan can also establish the municipality's intent to do future research programs or studies. For example, the regional plan set an intent to adopt an open space plan which became the Halifax Green Network Plan. And when we adopted uh, the Halifax Green Network Plan, uh, there is ongoing work related to it that will get its own direction in the regional plan. I'll also talk today about how the municipality has adopted Halifax, our climate change action plan, and how the regional plan will support, support the ongoing work of that plan. And finally, the regional plan identifies where there are needs for different types of programming or opportunities to partner with community or other levels of government. Taking action on climate requires cooperation across our community, 
and the regional plan can support partnerships with other groups to achieve our goals. Slide 13. This presents the progression of the regional plan over the past 15 years. In 2006, we approved the original regional plan, and in 2014, we conducted our first review. You might recognize the name RP plus five, which was the brand for that review. We're aiming to complete this review in 2022. Slide 14. The themes and directions document outlines the key ideas and planning issues that we'll address during the regional plan review. It's a chance to step back and ask everyone, do we have this right? Are we headed in the right direction? The feedback we receive will help provide focus and direction for our work during the review. Slide 15. The themes and direction document includes 11 themes. They're all highlighted on this slide and an overview is available, uh, overview of each theme is available to you on our website, shapeyourcityhalifax.ca slash regional dash plan. Today, we're focusing on issues that are part of two different themes, theme eight, enhancing environmental protection, and theme nine, leading through action on climate. Slide 15. Climate change is a real, urgent, complex, global crisis. With the changing climate, we face hazards to our health and safety, the natural world, and our economic growth. In HRM, Regional Council declared a climate emergency on January 29th, 2019. Climate impacts need to be considered as a critical part of all of our planning work. Slide 17. Environmental management was one of the core underpinnings of the regional plan when it was first adopted. In 2006, the regional plan identified the natural environment as one of HRM's defining features and recognized that growth and development in HRM had been and would continue to be shaped by a network of open space. We furthered this understanding with the adoption of the Halifax Green Network Plan in 2018. It provides a high-level overview of the areas and features that contribute to the region's green network. The Green Network Plan recognizes the important role that our natural open spaces play in both mitigating and adapting to the effects of climate change by capturing, storing, and reducing atmospheric carbon and offsetting the region's greenhouse gas emissions, as well as reducing the impacts in, of floods and heat waves by regulating stormwater runoff, stabilizing microclimates, reducing wind effects, and limiting, uh, sorry, limiting the urban heat island effect. Slide 18. <clears throat> Adopted by Regional Council in 2020, Halifax is the municipality's climate action plan to reduce emissions and help communities adapt to climate change or to a changing climate. The plan is aligned with the low carbon pathway recommended by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change which suggested that the risks of climate change could be substantially reduced if global warming was limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Halifax sets several emissions reduction targets, including a target of net zero municipal operations by 2030, community-wide targets of a 75% emissions reduction from the 2016 baseline by 2030, and achieving net zero emissions by 2050. While the target of net zero emissions is important, Halifax must commit to a steep reduction pathway to limit total emissions over time and stay within our carbon budget. Slide 19. So Halifax is a community-wide plan with many stakeholders and implementation requires us to think of climate impacts in all the work we do. The regional plan can take a powerful role in setting that direction. Through the review, we will develop policy, complete additional study and set up future work to implement the recommendations of Halifax. And I'll talk about some of that work in the, in the next couple of slides. Uh, slide 20. <clears throat> the regional plan has an important role to play, as I mentioned, in setting our land use policy and regulations in a way that supports our emission reduction targets. In 2016, buildings accounted for 70% of HRM's total energy use and 77% of total emissions. Retrofitting existing buildings and ensuring that new buildings are more efficient is necessary for a successful energy transition. One of the most important things we can do is to make sure that there aren't any barriers in our planning policy or regulations that would make it difficult for people to use these new energy efficient technologies. For example, are there regulations that would prevent installing solar panels because of our height restrictions? Or are there limits where electric vehicle charging stations could go on a site? So we can do that review of our regulations through the regional plan review. We may also have opportunities through our discretionary planning applications, which require council review and approval. For example, we could 
write policy that requires council to consider the energy efficiency of new developments, or when we're designing new communities through a master planning process, uh, we could look at whether there are opportunities to consider alternative, alternative energy systems. The HRM charter allows us to require district energy for the Cogswell area, and we could explore if there might be opportunities elsewhere as well. And finally, where there are existing policies and regulations, it will be important that those are kept up to date. For example, our wind energy policy was adopted in 2011. Through the review, we will check to make sure that that policy reflects current wind energy technology. Slide 21. Understanding climate change hazards and impacts, especially in vulnerable communities, are a critical aspect of emergency management and a core action of Halifax. As climate events become more extreme and occur more frequently, we can expect more disruptions and damage to our critical infrastructure systems. And those systems include energy, telecommunications, transportation, our water supply, wastewater treatment, solid waste management, buildings, and food systems. We must take action to proactively protect and strengthen our critical infrastructure and improve community resilience. The municipality can take a leadership role to identify current and future climate hazards and critical infrastructure that may be at risk to extreme climate events. Once we've identified those risks, we can develop strategies to mitigate them. The regional plan can include policy to prioritize resiliency measures to reduce risk and protect critical infrastructure and require that we build back better. For example, where we know there will be significant risk from sea level rise and extreme water levels on our coast, land use policy can direct important infrastructure away from those areas. Where we regularly plan for new development in our communities, regional plan policy can require that we consider emergency management and climate hazard projections early in the development process. Slide 22. Protecting the municipality's water resources is critical for our potable water supply, supporting wildlife and overall ecological health, recreation use and aesthetic values. The regional plan directs land use policies to regulate water flow, mitigate flooding, reduce water pollution and protect ecological function. Through the regional plan review, we will both be supporting ongoing work and looking at ways to update our existing regulations. Some ongoing work includes the proposed water quality monitoring program, which has recently been considered by the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee of Council. Assuming the proposed approach is adopted by Council, we would plan to write regional plan policy which supports that work. Where the proposed program involves working with community, the policy can lay out uh, directions that we can continue, excuse me, continue to build those partnerships. Another ongoing piece of work has been on stormwater management. So our infrastructure planning group has been working with Halifax Water on updating the joint stormwater standards, first for large scale developments on private property, and then um, with the municipal design guidelines or the so-called red book review is looking at both the public right of way and uh, using green infrastructure. The regional plan includes policy and sets up land use bylaw regulations for riparian buffers around water courses, and there is some regulation around wetlands, which aims to protect these features from being damaged by development. The Halifax Green Network Plan identified the need to further protect riparian areas and establish a consistent water course buffer across the region. Greater protection for wet wetlands is also needed as these areas serve important roles for natural stormwater management, provide wildlife habitat and act as carbon sinks. So we're intending to review those policies and regulations and make those updates. And finally, the regional plan sets out requirements for studying environmental features before development can take place for new communities. And we'll continue to do that as we plan for future growth. Uh, slide 23, please. <clears throat> Regarding coastal protection, we expect that sea level rise and extreme water levels exasperated by increasing frequency and intensity of storms will significantly impact the Atlantic coast. As a result of climate change, HRM can expect significant impacts from sea level rise and extreme water levels in our coastal areas, including flooding, saltwater intrusion, and coastal erosion, all of which can significantly damage infrastructure, property, and natural features. As a result, it's very important to limit damage to coastal communities and ecosystems by carefully managing development in these areas. The regional plan does set out vertical setback requirements that are implemented through the various community land use bylaws, but we've identified a few gaps in the way this regulation works. The province is continuing to work on the Coastal Protection Act regulations, and we've been meeting with Department of Environment to understand their proposed approach. 
We're hoping that our timelines will align so that we'll be in a position to adopt uh, revised policies and regulations that are both consistent with that provincial uh, act and also tailored to the HRM context. Uh, if our timelines don't align, there are likely still some adjustments to be made to our policies to strengthen them. Slide 24, please. And finally, uh, the Halifax Green Network Plan and Halifax both encourage the inclusion and maintenance of natural areas and green infrastructure in communities where growth is located or planned. The Urban Forest Master Plan uh, provides direction for planning, programming, and maintaining HRM's urban forest. Our natural areas and green infrastructure can help to manage stormwater, reduce the heat island effect, improve water quality, provide shade, and sequester carbon. So this kind of naturalization work is already being piloted in, in HRM to improve the environmental health in our urban areas and contribute to our actions on climate. Slide 25. That's the end of the, the presentation. Uh, to learn more, ask questions, uh, join the mailing list and make your voice heard, please visit our website at shapercityhalifax.ca slash regional dash plan or email us at regionalplan at halifax.ca uh, or call 902-233-2501. Uh, and uh, I will turn it over to Kathleen, who will moderate the question and answer period. Thanks, Kathleen. Great. Thank Great. you, Leah. Uh, next slide, please. So as Leah mentioned, and as I described earlier, uh, we're going to enter into our Q&A session uh, to submit comments or questions. You're welcome to use the ask a question tab, which is uh, to the right of your of your presentation screen. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions now. Um, next slide, please. So how it's going to work is you will submit questions. I will read the questions in the order that we they are received and direct them to our panel. Um, we'll get through as many as possible, uh, but we will be posting uh, a written sort of transcript of the questions uh, so that they will be available afterwards if there are any that are missed or that require a little bit more of a deep dive. Uh, we may post more fulsome answers there. Um, as I mentioned, we'll also be posting a recording of the presentation um, for people to come back and watch. Um, so please feel free to submit questions now. Um, next page, please, or next slide, please. I'll just quickly introduce our uh, panelists today. Uh, we have Shannon Miedema, who is the pro program manager for our energy and environment team at HRM. Kevin Bootlier, who is our clean energy specialist with energy and environment. Taylor Owen, who is our climate change specialist with energy and environment. Kate Green, who is the pro program manager for our regional planning team, and Leah Perrin, who is our principal planner for the regional planning team. Next slide, please. So just to get things started while we're uh, waiting for some comments to come in, I would just wanted to sort of start the conversation um, by asking, <laughs> Uh, and this is sort of generally for our T uh, for the energy and environment team. Uh, what is happening to uh, meet our retrofit targets in HRM? Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so, what are we doing to try and hit our our building retrofit targets? I think is the question. So, that's one of the um, seven critical core areas that we put forward to council when we took the plan uh, to them last June, um, because we saw it as an area where the city had a really big role to play in moving forward and um, building industry capacity and market readiness for deep energy retrofits of our existing building stock. And uh, so our kind of first order of business is to design a community program that incentivizes deep energy retrofits, renewable energy on buildings, as well as climate resiliency considerations. So looking at um, how to reduce risks from climate at the same time as doing that work in any particular building. Um, and so we have a retrofit design team with uh, a bunch of different stakeholders who are experts in different parts of this work. And um, They've been working on a weekly basis to try and come up uh, quite quickly with uh, a pilot program to test out. And we'll be bringing that forward to council this summer for approval and starting to roll it out. And then uh, Kevin and Taylor, if you have anything to add, feel free. 
Oh, fantastic. Great, thanks. So our first question, and I'm not 100% sure if anybody on our panel is going to be able to get into too much detail on this, but maybe uh, a bit more about, you know, sort of how we approach these kinds of decisions uh, is I'm glad you showed the St. Mary's Boat Club. The Boat Club is a casualty of climate change with rising ocean levels. Uh, the club floods every year. Has the city decided if it wants to m build a new boat club or move the existing building higher on the hill? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we have done some work at that site a uh, number of years ago now. They did a living shorelines pilot project on some of the eroding um, shoreline uh, at the St. Mary's Boat Club in partnership with some nonprofits and with a nature based solutions uh, business. And I think it was being monitored by um, a PhD or postdoc student at St. Mary's University. Um, and we do know that there's um, in our capital plan a few years out, there's uh, um, some money marked for the renewal of that asset. And that will require looking at the like current and future climate risks of that site and trying to figure out what the best long-term climate informed solution is. So one of the other big things we're working on um, across our whole community is doing some climate hazard mapping and risk and vulnerability assessments of our infrastructure and our assets, um, kind of across the whole spectrum of what we own and across the entire shoreline. And so um, the St. Mary's Boat Club would be part of that overarching work as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, so the, our next question has a, a, a lot of background on it. Um, I believe that this will probably be mostly for uh, the regional plan review team, uh, but uh, certainly if anybody from energy and environment would like to jump in, you're welcome to. Um, as, Halifax, as Halifax 2050 takes on a whole community approach to addressing and mitigating the effects of climate change in HRM, I'd like to hear whether the issue of climate change will be elevated within the next iteration of the regional plan and beyond. Um, so I'll put that forward for Leah, I think. I, I yeah, can take Kathleen. it, Kathleen. Oh, OK, I can take it. I've got a, a sets of that one. So um, it's Kate Green. I'm the Regional Policy Program Manager. Um, I would say that we agree with your statement, Bre uh, Brenna, and certainly you've asked if um, the focus on mitigation of climate change can be included in the principles and, of the regional plan, and we have done that. We've included it, um, especially in the idea of transforming as a community. Um, we think that we need, almost need to leapfrog in managing our growth right now, and we see the lens of climate change as being one of the most important ways we need to think about how we're growing. Um, so certainly it's of critical importance to us and it will be elevated throughout the regional plan review, uh, likely the regional plan itself as compared to the last iteration. The other thing I'll add is that we've included Shannon Miedema, who's here with us today uh, in our steering committee, um, who's helping us guide the regional plan review because we think this lens of climate change is so important to our work right now. Um, so she's at the table helping us make decisions and making sure we're guiding the municipality in the right direction. Great, thanks Kate. Um, I think this question may also be for you. Um, is there a plan for wilderness stewardship training for volunteers to mitigate the inadvertent damage caused by the public use of wilderness for recreation? Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I wouldn't say I'm aware of a plan right now for training of volunteers, a specific plan, although uh, some other folks on the in the group might be aware of that. But we have been um, speaking quite a bit with our parks and recreation team about how we manage the interface between um, development and wilderness areas and how we organize land use strategically to prevent um, impacts of uh, and uh, of really impacts on really important ecological areas. So an example of this would be where you have the uh, where you have development and then you have a wilderness area directly adjacent. 
um, you organize the development and the park in such a way that the heavier use portion of the park where you're going to have people abuts development um, and provides a bit of a buffer to the actual wilderness area or portion of the land that you want protected. Uh, we've been talking a lot about partnership and how we work in partnership with community to manage um, the environment and that that's a, a way that we need to work with community right now um, so that there's education and that we can make the public more aware of public impacts on wilderness areas, uh, the Im human impacts on wilderness areas. So I expect to see that conversation evolve over the coming years. And I don't know if anyone else has anything else they wanted to add to that. I would maybe just add that, you know, the province has designated uh, wilderness areas that have a set of restrictions for use. So they're very different from parks and parkland. And um, they have a certain amount of enforcement as well. I'm not sure if they are working with volunteers on any type of remedial activity, but that would be a question for the province. Great, thank you guys. Um, so this last question, I think this is the last question we've received from the public. Please feel free to submit more comments or questions if you have any. Um, I think, Kate, we might need this uh, is also sort of directed to our park staff, but if you could just provide some initial thoughts uh, with rising land costs, does the city plan on upping its budget for acquiring new parkland? Sure, thanks for the question, Kathleen, and that's a great question. Um, I think this is certainly something that Council is grappling with right now. Uh, we presented on the theme and direction report on this sort of wide reaching land use plan uh, last week, I think it was, or the uh, Committee of the Whole, and that question did come up around how are we managing parks and thinking about parks on a regional level and how do we strategize around how we acquire important pieces of land. Certainly um, there is a plan for acquisition that's already in the budget um, and that Parks and Recreation works toward, but if we want to make that larger and, and actually acquire significant pieces of land, um, then that would probably be a direction that Council would need to give staff. Um, but it's definitely being raised, especially with the conversation around Blue Mountain Birch Cove um, and our Sandy Lake area. Uh, people are definitely interested in understanding what can be done to preserve land over time. Great, thanks, Kate. Um, just going to see if there are any other questions. In the meantime, I think for the energy and environment team, um, just wondering what are you doing to increase the adoption of electric vehicles across the community? Great question, Kathleen. Um, so uh, the <laughs> Halifax uh, Regional Municipality, what we're doing now is we're just finalizing a municipal wide electric vehicle strategy. Um, and it's going to have both a public and a corporate component to it. So the public component is to determine where and in what quantity um, should uh, public EV charging be available for public use. And the intention of the uh, the public uh, deployment plan is to one, uh, ease range anxiety for property owners uh, who are looking to get electric vehicles, which is a major concern and a major barrier that is perceived by folks wanting to switch to an electric vehicle, um, but also give the, uh, you know, sort of give the uh, indication that there are investments being made uh, in this space so that if you were to go EV, uh, you'll be in, uh, you know, a good spot for the long term. Um, we're also looking to work with the province to try and implement some policies to make uh, EV adoption a lot easier. So um, to ensure that there is a stock at dealerships where it is actually very difficult to get them currently. And then in regards to our corporate uh, initiatives, we are looking to electrify our entire light duty fleet by 2030. So that strategy is hopefully going to be public later this summer. Um, and then we will start implementation uh, thereafter. Great, thanks so much, Kevin. Um, in terms of the uh, the targets that we've set for 2030 and 2050, um, do you feel that it's possible to meet the targets that we have set? 
That's a $22 billion question, Kathleen. <laughs> uh, that's actually the collective estimated guess of how much the climate plan will cost everybody in HRM, um, but with the resulting additional $22 billion to the good starting to be realized in like the 2030s. So this is over 30 years. Um, but Halifax is called Halifact because the ACT stands for Acting on Climate Together because the city, as the city, we recognize that we only, we play an important role. Um, we can directly control some of our emissions, about 2% of the total emissions, but it's really about working with all of our stakeholders and um, opening up policies and using those different levers that we have to um, really galvanize the the climate action movement in the city. So um, we can do it. It's 100% technologically possible, financially possible, but it's about doing things differently, um, get, being comfortable with getting away from our business as usual approach where we take a really long time planning and, not a, and we, we really need to dive into the action and we need our utilities and our other levels of government and everybody, um, all of our residents as well, uh, to do their part. And if we all um, mobilize quickly to do it, then we can succeed. But we really need to aggressively drive down our emissions by 2030. So and our so our window of opportunity is narrowing. And so that's the pressure, right? It's like we need urgent and really scaled up action. We've done some really great things that we can build on, but we really need to start scaling them up and acting much more quickly than we have been. Great, thanks so much. I'm just going to check to see if we've received any other questions. Um, this is probably for the regional plan review team. Um, would love to hear more on what will be incorporated into the regional plan to ensure that the expansion of HRM's solar energy financing program, Solar City, will allow HRM to further support deep energy retrofits needed across the municipality. Uh, what considerations are being taken to support homeowners, renters, rental property owners as they consider participation in such programs? So that's probably for for everyone on the panel. Yeah, I can. So, I, oh. yeah, go ahead, Kevin. I was just going to say that it's probably not really the role of the regional plan other than to enable types of directions on programs. That's much more of a kind of technical question, but Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, totally. And to limit mm, barriers uh, that, that may exist um, with uh, with some measures uh, being on the outside of the, the building, I suppose. Um, but uh, with the current solar city program, so we do have uh, legislative authority to expand that to energy efficiency measures, so anything that does reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. However, it is limited to nonprofits or residential properties. So what we are doing is um, we're looking to develop a new program, as Shannon mentioned, uh, with the de design group that we've developed in the last uh, couple of months or so to expand the program so it can hit many more measures, but also uh, be more equitable to other property owners and other property types. So we were, um, we are looking to hopefully be successful through a funding grant through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities so that we can actually do a study uh, to determine what type of accessible financing would be best for, uh, for renters uh, or for low to medium income property owners. Uh, and we're actually hoping to work with a third party financers or investors so that we can go beyond our current PACE program limitations uh, to ensure that all property owners within the municipality, um, regardless of the ownership type, can implement these uh, energy efficiency or solar measures within their property. So that is currently ongoing. Great. Thanks so much, Kevin. I, I could add to that, Kathleen, if that's OK. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I would. I would say the other thing we're thinking about is affordability and the idea of energy poverty. So we know we are in a tricky um, housing situation right now. Uh, a lot of people are um, struggling to make ends meet and um, be in a situation where they're living in, in housing uh, that they can actually afford. And energy poverty is something that we're thinking about actively and trying to build into the affordable housing conversation. So 
I think, uh, you know, to your point, Brenna, and think you, we have to think holistically in everything we're working on, you know, whether it be housing or just how we're organizing land use, we have to have this view of climate and understand how it's imp impacting people on a lot of levels. So, um, you know, solar energy and just allowing people additional opportunities to try out different technologies at the site level are really important. And in planning, we're just trying to remove barriers to that, but also advocate for that type of thinking in all our work. Perfect, thank you. Um, so does the municipality have any additional data that would help us assess climate risks? Uh, so as part of the climate plan development, we had our consultants do um, or put together a bunch of the kind of current and anticipated climate risks um, for the municipality. And, you know, that all kind of comes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they're about to release their next major report this summer. Um, so we're really looking forward. Well, we're, we're kind of scared for what it's going to say because yeah. every time they release a new report, um, things are more serious than the last time. And we we um, have heard that uh, that's what we can expect this time around in terms of things like the, mm -hmm. the rate of change for sea level rise and extreme storms and things like that. Um, but then we work with our partners locally to kind of hone in the global numbers to make them relevant at a local scale. And the federal government has some great online resources, the climateatlas.ca is a great place to start for anyone wanting to look at that type of information. Um, we also have work that we've done on, you know, floodplain modeling along the Shuby or the Sackville and Little Sackville rivers, and we're working on the Shuby system. Um, that's all um, available publicly. We also have LIDAR, so we have really detailed digital elevation modeling for our entire municipality now we used to just have it for a subsection of it so it's our entire coastline and our watersheds and our topography and that can be used for so many different applications and that's available on open data so students and academics and and consultants and everybody can access it for research and different projects and that's what that's going to form the base of all the new uh, climate and flood risk mapping that we're going to be doing once we get the big dated international report. Great. Um, so then I think probably my last question is just around uh, what actions are being taken when we're thinking about protecting residents from the increasing impacts of climate change. Taylor, are you wanting this one? No. <laughs> um, yeah, around adaptation. So adaptation is, you know, a really interesting one. We we spent a lot of time at first on mitigation and then realized that even with all of our efforts around mitigation, we need to look at adaptation. So we need to look at preparing ourselves for impacts that we that we have already experienced and that we know we'll experience again and probably at at changing rates and changing severities over time. So it's about building resilience. So resilient communities, safe communities, safe and resilient infrastructure and healthy ecosystems. And um, so there is a lot of work to do on this side of things. We only hired our first climate change specialist focused on adaptation a couple of months ago. And, um, you know, our first order of business is working with the province on their Coastal Protection Act to see what regulations are going to come through for the city in terms of um, how we manage um, planning and development along the coast as well as um, uh, trying to get going on our climate hazard mapping and doing some risk and vulnerability assessments of critical infrastructure. And we're working with our emergency management team um, on that as well. There's lots of work to do on it. Great, thanks so much, Shannon. Um, I'm just wondering how we are engaging with stakeholders in Halifax. Yeah, I can take this one. Uh, so in the creation of the plan, we did a lot of stakeholder engagement. Uh, we have, um, I think, almost 400 people, including internal stakeholders. So those are people across HRM who are working on in a lot of different business units, uh, as well as external organizations, so different levels of government, 
uh, academic institutions, nonprofits, um, businesses, Nova Scotia Power and our utilities. Um, and so that group really uh, came together to help us inform how the plan was created. And we've um, we've been putting a lot of uh, work into keeping that group together because it was really informative for us um, and a really good kind of group to have together to be able to bounce ideas around and, and get some action going. So um, that group has now been moving into the implementation phase. And uh, we've been meeting on a quarterly basis to provide updates from you know, how is the plan being implemented from Halifax, as well as what are the climate actions that are happening across the city that are feeding into this kind of collective action of implementing the plan. Uh, and we've also been doing some collective impact work. So, you know, bringing together a lot of different people from different stakeholder organizations to start working on projects together and you know, driving down emissions or coming up with adaptation projects. So, um, yeah, it's been a really great opportunity to, to kind of connect with people working on climate across the city. Awesome. Thanks, Taylor. Um, just checking, but I don't think I see any more questions, so we may wrap up. Uh, Shiloh, is it possible to go to the next slide? Awesome. So this is just uh, to reiterate the contact information for the regional plan review. We certainly invite all of our uh, attendees to uh, visit our Shape Your City page. Uh, email us if you have any additional questions or comments that you'd like to talk about more or give us a call at 902-233-2501. Um, and there's a variety of other engagement tools. And as I mentioned, a recording of this presentation, as well as a, a transcript of the questions and answers uh, will be posted on Shape Your City and available for everyone to review. Um, next slide, please. So thank you very much for uh, your time this afternoon. I'd also like to thank our presenters and panelists. Um, have a great day, everybody.